colleagues, um, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to briefly talk to you uh, during this session. My name is uh, Stefan Parmentier. I'm uh, teaching sociology of crime, sociology of law and sociology of human rights at this uh, university in Leuven. And uh, the time is short, uh, so that's why I'm trying to be short as well. Uh, I would briefly like to sketch three main issues that relate to culture of peace and culture of uh, education. And actually I would like to start by going back to the paradigm of human rights itself. Um, this is the terminology that was used by our colleague from the Columbia University in the United States, Louis Henkin, who calls the human rights uh, paradigm of our time. Uh, because they have replaced, in his view, other grand paradigms such as religion or socialism or even other paradigms. And they do constitute a gradual but inevitable uh, emancipation of mankind and of individual people from the shackles of domination and power politics. We all know that since uh, the end of the Second World War, an impressive machinery and an architecture of human rights uh, norms and institutions and procedures have been developed and this is of course both the case at the universal level of the United Nations but also at regional levels of uh, regional institutions, uh, Council of Europe, uh, Organization of American States, African Union and of course not to forget the European Union. But of course we also know that the impressive human rights machinery has not prevented the eruption of a wide range of conflicts in the same period and several of them uh, have really demonstrated an extremely cruel uh, level of determination, an extremely cruel level of uh, violence. And uh, suffice it just to uh, remind ourselves of uh, ex-Yugoslavia, which was already mentioned, but also of Rwanda, Guatemala and other parts of the world. So despite this machinery of human rights uh, uh, norms and procedures, conflicts do continue to erupt and do continue to exist. Which brings me to the, the second point, namely that on top of developing human rights and human rights machineries, it's as important to look at the concept of rights in itself. And it has been, of course, as you know, heavily criticized to only focus on rights and to have a strong emphasis on a culture of claims and rights without looking at the other side of the coin, which is to look at responsibilities and duties. Uh, particularly from uh, specific parts of the world, like third world countries, a lot of criticism has been voiced against this culture of individualism, uh, which uh, is developed at the expense of due attention to groups and to communities worldwide. And, uh, of course, for that reason also at the neglect of responsibilities and duties of communities and individuals as much as uh, states. Um, this emphasis or this, let's say, this um, growing emphasis on responsibilities has been demonstrated in a number of documents uh, starting from the Universal Declaration of Human Responsibilities of 1997 over the Valencia Declaration of Human Duties and Responsibilities of 1998 uh, to which uh, Patricia Morales here has uh, contributed heavily uh, to all kinds of drafts uh, of declarations on social responsibilities and the like. And actually uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights itself dating back to 1948 already has a very strong reference to that idea of duties in its article 29 that states that everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. So there is a tradition of duties, we seem to have forgotten it since 1948 and uh, Possibly the uh, anniversary of the declaration, the 60th anniversary, could be a good occasion to revive that interest. Now, the third step in the reasoning is what does this have to do with human rights and with peace? Uh, Mr. Ambassador was already relating to the right to peace, which is indeed a so called third generation right, a third generation human right, and which does extend from the individual level. For example, the peace to property, to uh, be left alone and to possess 
uh, one's property and to enjoy one's property to community peace, uh, the peaceful environment, the possibility to live with one's neighbors in the peaceful environment, to the state level, where states have uh, peaceful relationships uh, intrastate, but also between states. Now, peace researchers, of course, make a, a, a main difference between negative peace and positive peace. And I think in most of the peace literature these days, and in most of the policy developments which we have been witnessing, uh, when it comes to conflict and conflict resolution, mostly negative peace has been stressed, has been emphasized, namely the silencing of the arms. But of course, positive peace requires something else. It requires uh, a more deep understanding of what conflict is, of how to prevent conflicts, of how to create uh, cohesion, social cohesion, at various levels. And here is where the responsibility comes in again the other side of the coin to create a culture of peace not only as a right but also as a responsibility for each of the actors who actually want to enjoy that right uh, to peace so both individuals as well as communities and states do have responsibilities to work towards peace and in this case peace is much more than just abstaining from violence or from conflict so many examples of course uh, uh, abound today. Uh, one example could be to think of the DRC, the Republic uh, in the Congo, and to think of the many types of conflicts which are actually intertwined, an economic conflict, a political conflict, uh, a conflict about resources um, which takes very violent forms. But on the other hand, uh, let's uh, have a look closer to home. Uh, even in this country, in Belgium, uh, as uh, all of you know, there is a lot of conflict going on conflict which apparently cannot be resolved for the moment by the two negotiating parties. So conflicts are everywhere. If we want to think of peace and to development of peace, then we have to start working in various ways and directions. And it seems to me that a bottom-up approach, whereby individuals start in their own uh, immediate environments and living environments and uh, extend these initiatives of peacemaking and conflict resolution in non-violent ways are very important bottom-up initiatives. Finally, um, I think in most of our um, talks today and uh, interventions, we all adhere to the uh, hypothesis that more education will actually lead to an increased standard of living and therefore to a lowering level of conflict. And I personally subscribe to that hypothesis as well, except that I think we need to do more research. We need to do more research into the various components of this hypothesis, whether indeed education can be limited to, for example, what we are taught in schools, or whether there is a difference between education and learning. Uh, take the Wikipedia example, but also take all kinds of practices where people okay, engage in cool. conflict management. <laughs> well, learning is more than education. Um, I'm pleased to see this uh, kind of initiative uh, taking place uh, as part of the um, of the IPRA conference, because you know uh, these days in Leuven, the International Peace Research Association is gathering, and that's exactly the good time and the good uh, possibility and opportunity to do this research and to identify new areas for research. So to finish off. Uh, the paradigm of human rights, which Louis Henkin was talking about, well, in this case, and in our vision, uh, could very well evolve, and possibly has to evolve, into a paradigm of peace and a paradigm of peace culture. So thank you uh, for your attention. Okay.